This is Justin Etheridge from CodeThinked.com, and welcome to the first part of my video series here on TechPub titled Exploring Link. So what is Link? Link stands for Language Integrated Query. Link is just a set of libraries within the .NET framework that allows us to perform set-based operations against almost any data source. It's a bit like SQL, but we aren't limited to querying out of tables in a database. We can form queries against objects in memory, in a database, in an XML file, or pretty much any kind of data. I really want to show you, but before we get started, we're going to have to lay a bit of groundwork. The first thing that we are going to talk about is type inference using the var keyword. This was introduced in c 3.0, which is part of .NET 3.5. This is often a point of confusion amongst developers since the versions of the C-sharp language closely follow the .NET versions, but not exactly. I'm going to go ahead and introduce var now, mainly for clarity in the samples, but we will also need it later in the screencast. What var allows us to do is to not have to specify the type of a local variable during an assignment. So if we wanted to declare a variable of type int, we could do something like this. As you can see here, I haven't specified the type of this variable. I simply assigned one. But if I hover over the var next to the variable, you'll see that it actually is a system.int32. If I wanted to do the same thing with the string, I could do something like this. Again, if I hover over the var, you'll see that it shows system.string. We call this type inference because the compiler is inferring the type of the variable based on the assignment. The compiler is doing this and so it's happening at compile time, but Visual Studio also helps us out by showing the types. Since the compiler needs an assignment to determine the variable's value, if I did something like this, it would be an invalid statement. Bar isn't a variant type, meaning I can't just assign any value to it, so I must assign some value to the variable when it's declared. Since the compiler can't determine a type from my variable here, the statement is invalid. If I try to build it, you can see that we get an error that says implicitly type local variable must be initialized. Since the compiler is simply picking the type of the variable for us and nothing dynamic is happening, reassigning this variable to a different type will also result in an error. So if I reassign my string to the number two, since we already declared it as a string, if I compile that, we get an error that says cannot implicitly convert type int to string. Right now you might be thinking that var just looks like a clever little trick to let you avoid having to specify a type when declaring a variable. In fact, you might see it as being kind of bad since we're losing type information whenever we assign something. Somebody has to be able to hear to look at my num and know that if I assign one to it, it's going to become an N32 and not an N64 or a byte. The true power of var comes in when we're instantiating class types. So let's say we wanted to have a dictionary that went from int to string. So here if we look at this um, instantiation of my dictionary, we'll see that we have a lot of repetitive type information. On the left side, to tell the variable type, we have dictionary int of string, and on the right, when we instantiate the type, we also have new dictionary into string. But var allows us to replace the type on the left, and we end up with var my dictionary equals new dictionary int to string. This allows us to ditch some of the extra type information, but if you look at this, we're not actually losing anything. All we're doing is getting a very much more succinct syntax for declaring this variable. Now var can also be used as a result of a method call or even an assignment from a property. So if I had something like this, that even though this is a valid, this is valid syntax, when looking at the code, you can't actually tell what type my type is. It just doesn't give me a whole lot of information. Whether or not you see this as something that you want to do is really a matter of style. The second feature I want to introduce to you was also new in c 3.0, and it is collection initializers. Collection initializers are simply syntactic sugar for populating a collection or array. 
Syntactic sugar is simply something that you add to the language to make it easier for humans to use. Collection initializers look like this. Here you can see that we're declaring a new variable using the var keyword, and then we're assigning it to a new array which has no type. Again, with the collection initializers, since we're using the integers 1 through 6 inside of the array, the type of int is inferred for the array. The collection initializer syntax, as you can see here, simply uses curly braces with a comma separated list of items in order to declare a new array. You can also use the collection initializer syntax to declare lists. Here again you see we're using the var keyword, but since the list is a generic type, we have to tell it what type we're going to be putting into it. We again use the curly braces with a comma separated list of items in order to fill the list. The collection initializer syntax can also be used with dictionaries. Here you see that we're using the var keyword again. We're declaring a new dictionary that goes from int to string. We're using the curly braces, but instead of a comma separated list of items, we now have individual items that are also within curly braces. So the first set of curly braces here is one test, and that represents the key of one with the value of test in our dictionary. And then we have another group that represents the key 2 with the item test2. In this way, we have a comma separated list of items to populate the dictionary. Collection initializers really just provide us with a super easy way to declare arrays, lists, and dictionaries. They'll come in handy during the screencast, and I just want to make sure that you aren't thrown off by seeing them. The next C-Sharp 3.0 feature I want to show you is extension methods. We'll start off by declaring a new array with the numbers 1 through 10 in it. So the next thing we want to do is try to perform a simple link operation on this array. So you see here at the top in the using statements that we already have system.link imported by default. If I go over here to my solution explorer, you'll also see that we have a reference to system.core. System.core is where the core link namespaces are located. Since we're importing system.link already, I can look at the methods available on the nums array. As you can see here, there's a huge number of methods on this array that weren't there previously to C Sharp 3.0. You might be wondering where most of these methods came from. The answer is they're linked methods. So in order to just confuse you a little bit more, let's go up here, comment out the using.link statement, come back and do the exact same thing. You'll notice that most of those methods are gone. So where do they go? The answer is twofold. So first, we can't actually declare two parts of a type in two separate namespaces. But in C-Sharp 3.0, Microsoft added an interesting feature called extension methods that really kind of lets us fake it. Extension methods let us add methods to virtually any type, or at least give the appearance that we're adding methods to virtually any type. 